Welcome to our city church. We're uh, starting a brand new series today called Oh What Fun, um, and we're looking forward to it. If you're a guest today, uh, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Pastor Chris. My wife, Brenda, and I, we pastor here at our city church, and we're just so stoked that you came. So thanks for being here with us. Uh, if you brought a Bible today uh, to be able to study and learn along with... Um, <laughs> Uh, please go ahead and open it up to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. Uh, Matthew is in, the, it's the beginning of the New Testament, and that's where you'll, you'll find us getting ready to, to go after it. I, um, I want to let you know today that if you are not a Bible reader or you wouldn't kind of profess to be like a Christian, I want to let you know that we're glad you're here, and, and I want to put you at ease. You don't need to believe what 
what we believe at our city church to be a part of what we're doing here. We're glad that you're here, and we want to share some things that we hope will help your life. Um, and, and we do, I do believe in Jesus, of course, and, and I'm a Bible guy. I believe in the Bible as the blueprint for life to be fulfilled by. Um, and I think it's everything God wanted us to know and to learn and to, to be able to... Um, to grow into, uh, but I didn't always believe that, and so we're very sensitive and aware and uh, open to people coming at all different places of the journey. So thanks for being here and, and giving us a chance today to share our our, our heart and desire for you um, to, I think, I hope, experience what uh, Christmas is really all about. Christmas is kind of like a unique season, right, because it's, it's so epic, right? Like it has such promises of grand proportions, right? When you come into the season of Christmas, it just has its own like vibe and feel. Like you just feel like it's got to be so great. And that actually can lead it um, to being really fun. I know there's those of you in this room right now, you, lo you love you some Christmas, right? Like I want to ask real quick, how many of you start decorating Right after Thanksgiving, where are you at? Let me see. Okay, yeah, there's some Christmas loving fools in here. How many of you, if you see decorating being brought out before turkey is cut, you're annoyed? You're like, no, that's cheating. Don't do that, right? Yeah, exactly, right? It's like there's a rule to that, right? Like you can't wear white pants after, I don't know if that's a rule. But um, there's, these, these, there's these feelings. And why? It was because Christmas, like, is so great. When it's good, it's good, right? It's good because it's got a lot of fun things. It's, it's got things like shopping and decorating. And, you know, it's got things like hanging lights, family, and uh, great food, giving gifts. Whew. It was, sorry, I, was, I didn't blow on it fast enough. Um, you know, it's got, it's got all these, like, uh, fun and amazing people that you haven't seen in a while, right? Like, oh, it's just so good. It's like, oh, I haven't seen you. I'm so glad. We have family. We get to have football games. We get to get new things. There's, there's, uh, there's all these fun, cool things. And it elicits a lot of fun emotions, right? Exciting emotions, <laughs> joyful emotions. Um, you know, drinking hot cocoa by the fire, right? Doesn't that just sound so great? Or, or eggnog with whatever you put in it, right? Like, I don't... <laughs> I don't know, I don't know. And, uh, you know, or it's like these ideas of like wearing um, scarves or fuzzy socks. Get in touch with your socks, sir. I know some of you are like, what? I don't wear fuzzy. Sir, just try it one time. <laughs> fuzzy socks at home. No one has to see them. Don't post about it, okay? But take it from me. No, I'm just kidding. I don't have fuzzy socks. Um, Brenda has fuzzy socks. I watch Brenda put on fuzzy socks. I don't mess with that. Um... <laughs> I spare myself no level of comfort at home. I, I will tell you that. It is, it is, you know, important to have really good, nice sheets and toilet paper in my house. Okay? Just, amen? Anyone else? If you got nice bread and cheap toilet paper, there's something wrong with you. All right? It's reverse. Okay? Give me cheap bread, nice toilet paper. Because you're going to need it. For your cheap bread. All right. Um, see, you were with me. Not everyone was tracking, but she's, you know. So there's these wonderful things that all this stuff makes us feel. But Christmas can, can kind of take a turn on you also. It can, um, it can go south. It can feel really difficult. Um, and it can feel bad because it can get real stressful, right? So Christmas is, is also uh, shopping and decorating and hanging lights and seeing family and gaining weight, and seeing people you haven't seen in a while. So for all the same reasons that it could be great, it could also be really challenging for the same people. We just talked about difficult people for a couple weeks, and it's like, yeah, there's all this stuff. And it, and it could get even a little more serious than that, right? Like, there's, for some of us, this is, um, this is a tough season. It could feel lonely, right? You could be disconnected from people um, in your family. It, it, you could feel disconnected of your own. It's the end of the year, and you're kind of evaluating, like, how did this year go? How am I doing? How is work? How are the finances? Can I afford to buy the toy that my child wants? Um, is, are we spending money wisely? Are we eating? A it's like all this stuff, right? Like, and, and, and not only that, but there's, there's 
there's um, the reality for some of you that this is your first Christmas without someone, right? Like we have people who passed away in 2018, and so this is the first Christmas, and first Christmases are totally different. Second Christmases, third Christmases, they're their own unique story, but the first Christmas is really hard. And for some of you, that's the space that you're in. Others of you, you your marriage is in a difficult like season, right? And, and you look at these, these movies and these pictures and people post and they send out all these cards and everyone's all smiling and you look at yours and you're thinking like, it's, it's not that right now at home. It's hard, it's difficult. And it's hard for us to capture the idea of what we think Christmas is. But I wonder if that's the problem. I wonder if the problem is that we have a false idea of what really even the first Christmas introduced us to. That I wonder if we could be honest as a church. Something I find that the Christian church has a hard time doing with its own story and with itself at times. At our city church, we want to be honest. We want to be honest about the real Bible story. And, and some of us have never taken a second glance at like what was really going on. And, and so it's important for me as we build this church and as I pastor you as a church that I always lead you to being honest and real with your story and with the story of what we believe from the Bible. And, and today what I want to do is I want to look at something that when you read it, it doesn't, nothing about it uh, really like is inspiring. Because today what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a genealogy. Some of you know what that is. It's where you talk about who, who was, you know, aunt, uncle, grandma, grandpa. And we're going to look at the genealogy that Matthew opens up with. Uh, but I want you to understand today that right in the middle of the Christmas story might be the problem that some of us experience at Christmas, which is this. We're striving to, uh, to attain and to have a peace or a joy or a hope that we are striving and spending. We're still trying to get it, but we don't understand that we're going about it the wrong way. Because um, a perfect Christmas is not the absence of chaos or pain or disappointment and some of us have a false idea of what a real good Christmas would be it would mean I've got the right job the family's not fighting everyone's at peace my son is back home my daughter is is you know off drugs like everything's cool right I'm not fighting with my spouse our grandkids are, are back in church my son or like that is the perfect Christmas it's the perfect snapshot that I would send to everyone and say see look how amazing my life is and we think that would be a perfect Christmas. But I, I want to present to you today that if we go back to the first Christmas, but that maybe isn't even supposed to be the portrait that God wants us to even attain or to have. Maybe that's not even possible. Maybe that is a false picture that we're all striving for and never getting and never attaining because it's not real and it's not even what Jesus intended for us to have. Peace is not powerful because peace is peace. Peace is powerful it's not powerful when you have peace. You don't need peace when you're calm. You need peace when it's chaotic. Okay? Joy is not significant when you're happy. You can't tell that you have joy because you're so happy with your circumstances. But when your circumstances are not happy, now you can really feel joy because it emerges from the rubble of disappointment and you can't understand how can I feel joy in the midst of what I'm experiencing. That, that is joy. See, Christmas isn't about you getting joyful living all the time or peaceful living all the time. That's what we think. That's what we've believed. We've been sold that. And that's, it's a part of our whole economy. I get it. No big deal. But a part of what we do is we let the way the society needs to get us groomed so we'll spend money and all the companies can get in the black on Black Friday. Then we start to think, yeah, that's what also God expects life to always be like is amazing and awesome. And when it's not, something's wrong with me. But I present to you today that there's a problem with that. And I want to use Jesus' genealogy to unpack that and to show you, I think, what Christmas really is about and what Christmas hope and Christmas joy and Christmas love, Christmas peace can really be all about. Let's pray. Jesus, I invite you to teach us today. I invite your wisdom to roam about this room. God, I invite you to speak to everyone watching online today. Let them know that you see them right where they're at. And that you want to speak your real peace, your real joy, your real love and hope right into their life this Christmas season. For a lot of us, this, this is a big season. It's a big concept for us because the pain is there and there is chaos and there is un, there's an uh, unsettling happening and there is strife and challenge and difficulty and we need 
you. We can't get out of it on our own. Help us, God, to let go of any false idea we have about Christmas. God, if we have a false image of kind of like almost like an idol, like an idea that we're pursuing as that's the God, if we could just get that, we would be okay. God, would you shatter those false ideas today with your truth, with your word, with your love, and help us then to be able to experience by today the joy, the peace, the hope, the love of what Christmas meant that first Christmas. And may that be for us today as well. I ask this in your mighty name today, Jesus. And if you believe that, would you say amen? amen. Everybody say there and then. Hey, if you're new around here at Our City Church, I always preach from a perspective called there and then. What that means for me is I want you to know what was happening there and then in the Bible, okay, before we talk about how to apply it in the here and now. Because listen, if you don't understand the world of the Bible, you can never understand the words. I can't tell you how many times I get on Facebook or Instagram or something and I see somebody manipulating, messing up scripture because they just want to say what they want to say with it and they grab and stab a scripture verse for their own purposes. But that's actually not even what that stuff meant and I don't think that that's appropriate. I don't think it's right. So I want you to know what was going on there and then. Um, Matthew is one of the four writers of the story of Jesus. He was an eyewitness account. And Matthew is, is interesting because Matthew writes to the Jewish people and he specifically wants the Jewish people to understand that this Jesus is their promised Messiah. So he's going to include things that need to point to who Jesus is in the genealogy. Now, he opens up the story of Jesus with like who was married to who and who had what kid, right? That, that, that's kind of an interesting way, but he's wanting to make sure, hey, just so all y'all know, all 300 plus of those prophecies that are in your guys' Bible, okay, the, the Torah, the Law, and the Prophets, Jesus fulfilled all of them. But before I tell you about all those stories, before I reference all the Old Testament scriptures, there's more Old Testament references in Matthew's Gospel than the other Gospels. Why? Because he goes back to their own, hey, this is your Bible, the, your own Torah, your own law, your own prophets say this, and Jesus did it. Hello, let's go. Matthew 22, go read Matthew 22 if you want extra credit for Bible reading this week. Why? Because Matthew 22 points out everything Jesus goes through on the cross. The entire crucifixion was written about thousands of years before Jesus ever went to the cross, and then Jesus goes through it all. I mean, the Jewish people knew this whole story, but they were divided on whether or not Jesus was actually the Messiah. Now, who's the Messiah? Messiah was a promised, in their mind, king ruler that would be like David used to be. And what did David do? David whooped da uh, Goliath, took over the crown eventually, and became the first major king to rule with God's blessing. Now, he's not the first king. Saul was the first king, but he took over for Saul, and he becomes the king that God makes a promise to. This is important. Listen, he makes a promise to David, and he says, I will always keep one of your descendants on the throne of Israel. Now, that's powerful promise. That means like, hey, your lineage will live on forever. But it's the second major promise. The first big promise was to a guy named Abraham. His name was Abram at the time. He couldn't get pregnant with his wife because she and him were both old. Now, the Bible doesn't say whether or not he was still shooting bullets or blanks. But <laughs> what we do know is she was old. Okay? That's all we know. I'm using terms I hope will work because some of y'all brought kids in here, even though we got kid room in the bag and all the rest. But since, you know, some of y'all, you know, knew, I, I get it. I just don't want to. So Sarah ends up pregnant. All right. And now all of a sudden it's like, whoa. And what did he say to Abraham? I will bless the entire world through you. What a promise to every mom in this room that God says, I will, I will bless the world through you. Well, uh, your children will bless the world. So this is a big promise to the Jewish people. And the Messiah had better be somebody who somehow blesses the whole world. And if he don't, doesn't get the checkbox. Now, here's what we end up having. Watch this. This is the deal. We have Jesus' genealogy started by Matthew speaking to Jewish people. And what do we know he's got to include? He's got to include Abraham and David. If you don't, then it's fake. It's false. It's not real. But... Here's what I love about our Bible. Listen, here's what I love. Abraham had been waiting forever to get pregnant, and they never could. And, and I understand that. Brent and I, we, we, for three years, tried to get pregnant, and we couldn't. And then Eliana, three, three and a half years later, she, she, we were given the gift of Eliana. And, and you know, we're, we're, it's no secret that we've been trying to build our family, and we're about two years into it again. And so I, I personally, my wife and I, we understand the pain of wanting to have something that you can't have. 
and not knowing why, and, and every doctor and medical, it's like, everything's fine. Obviously, it's fine. We have a daughter, but for whatever reason, it is what it is. And so Abraham is given this promise, this promised son. Isaac's his name. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is who the God was named of. And David comes from this lineage. Now Matthew's going to introduce this whole idea. And what does he start with? He's going to start with, do you remember who these people were? And this is important because they introduced longing. Why? Because the world that Jesus was born into was longing for saving. The economy was destroyed. Ro the Roman emperors were, were, were stealing land, killing people who didn't believe what they wanted to believe. The economy had no hope, okay? People didn't have good jobs. People were, 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 um, were vulnerable. It was, it was torn to pieces. The whole place was like awful if you were not Roman, and if you were one of the sub-nations, like, like nations, man, Rome was not kind to you. It took over you. And so Jesus comes into the darkness of that night, of that life. But listen to me. This is where I think Christians get it wrong with how we do Christianity. We polish it and sanitize it. And people who don't believe cannot accept it because they know how to Google things and find out, wait a minute, how come, you didn't, how come you're not acting like that's actually in your story? Why do you sidestep that? Well, what, okay, well, so you're going to be staunch about this, but you don't give, a, you're fine with this. So which one is it? It's like, this is a big problem, right? Like, oh, these people can't go to heaven, but you can get divorced and still be okay in church for a lot of these religious people. But go ask Jesus what he thought about divorce. He was not cool with divorce, but we're going to hate these people. Wait, uh, so wait, which one? So you get to choose? Because if you really want to go to the letter of the law, there's a lot of us that actually, all of us, we're all disqualified for one reason or another. So it gets really problematic when you get really religious. And this is where religious people are not honest. They're not even honest about Jesus' own story. They sanitize. He's perfect. You're right. He is perfect. But his whole family ain't. So if you're in this room right now or listening online and you think your family's jacked up, <laughs> I invite you into the first Christmas narrative presented to us by Matthew, the gospel writer, as we look into the story of the first Christmas and Jesus' crazy family. <laughs> this is what it says. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah. Pay attention, y'all. This is who brought the Son of God to the world. First of all, lining up first, we have the Son of David. That's who Jesus is. Why does that have to be? Because of the promise. So it has to be one of David's descendants or else Jesus doesn't check the box and the Jews could say, no, not the Messiah. So he is in the lineage of David, which we'll get to. He starts next with the son of Abraham. So both of these right away, right off the bat, are historical, like just huge, like foundational understandings for these people saying, wow, okay, all right, well, I mean, hard, hard to argue, let's keep moving. Verse 2, it says this. It says that Abraham was the father of Isaac. So right away, everyone listening to this would be like, oh yeah, Abraham, our father. Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had father Abraham. I am one of them, you, so are you. So let's just praise the Lord, right arm. Father Abraham had many sons, right? If you didn't go to church, grow up, you don't know what I'm doing, and it looks weird, and it is. It's basically the Christian version of the hokey pokey. But <laughs> moving right along. So what? What you have is a reference to the foundation. These people grasp it. They understand it. They know who Abraham is. Isaac is the miracle son. This is important because Mary has also got a miracle son that has been promised that Matthew's going to write about. His name is Jesus. So you have the promise, the original promise to Abraham where he has a miracle son named Isaac who through his descendants will bless the whole world. And then the angel comes later to Mary and says, your miracle son will also be blessing the whole world. And oh, by the way, he's the descendant of this Isaac character. See, the story is completing itself here. They know what's being tied to it. They know the dots that are being connected. Now, you may not, if you're not a Bible reader, if you're not a theologian, you don't love this stuff, but this is what I want you to learn. I want us to grow. I want you to develop and strengthen as a church, as an individual, because I want us to know what we believe, why we believe what we believe. So, you have this place where now Abraham is spoken of the father of Isaac. Now, watch. The I Isaac is the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Judah and his brother. Stop right there. Now, Who's Jacob? Jacob, his name means the deceiver. Because he stole his brother Esau's birthright and tricked him out of it. So he became the one with the birthright. And he wrestles with God and he, he spends his life being a shyster. So right away, we've got somebody who is, is incapable of really lining up for a, a good family heritage. We've got a liar deceiver 
and, and now he's, he's, his name, some of you may not know this, but Israel, the nation of Israel, actually is from the 12 sons of Jacob. Why? Well, because God changes Jacob's name. Israel is not just the name of a country. It's the name of a person. Jacob's name becomes Israel. God changes Jacob's name and says, you will now become Israel and your descendants, your sons. So when in the New Testament, for instance, Paul, Paul is a writer of two thirds of the New Testament. He refers to himself in some of his writings as Paul, a Benjamite. Why? Well, because Jacob, whose name becomes Israel, had a son named Benjamin and he had a tribe and the 12 tribes of Israel were from the 12 sons of Jacob, whose name became Israel. You tracking? So this is all happening. This is important for where I'm now going to take you. Because that's wonderful. That's glorious. Miracle children. 12 tribes of God-fearing men. What a blessing, right? If that was it, every one of us should feel super guilty and bad when your Christmas can't be perfect and your family is broken. But fortunate for us, that's not the story of Jesus. And that's not Jesus' family because they continue and they tell the real story of who Jesus' family was. Judah, verse 3, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. The fact that a woman is even mentioned in a genealogy is unique in its time. Women didn't get mentioned like that. Furthermore, anywhere you take the gospel of Jesus and preach it, women are treated better all around the world when the real gospel of Jesus is treated. Jesus had women disciples. You didn't have women disciples back then. It wasn't allowed, but Jesus did. So he elevates the women. So anytime you are properly preaching the Bible, women are treated better. Even the genealogy of Jesus includes women just to make sure. Yeah, it's, it's got tough past and stories, but they don't hide and act like it's not there. This is what I love. And this is what I think is important. My wife and I, we're not going to pretend that like everything's always great. If you need that in a pastor and you want a caricature of someone trying to pretend and perform up on stage so you can have this idea image of like what you think a pastor and his wife and his kid are supposed to be, this is seriously going to be a disappointment for you because we're going to let you know when it ain't right, when we're struggling, when we can't get pregnant. Like we're going to be honest and real. Why? Because I think that the world is looking for honest and real. I don't think they want fake and pretend and, and perfect anymore. I think they want like, dude, are you real though? I, I, I can, I'd rather have you be aware and broken than unaware and pretending. And that's just not the kind of pastor we're going to be. You know why? Because I've gone to that church. I've worked at that church. And I'm not going to go to that church. I don't want you to go to that church. And I ain't going to work at that church no more. I don't want to work in a place where the pastors have to pretend. Where they have to be these figurines for the people to feel like they're in this little bubble called Christianity. Bump that. That's not real. It's fake, and it puts pastors in prison where they have to act and pretend all the time so the people stay, like, cool in their little, like, trance of Christianity. It's not honest. And then people who are not Christian don't want to be a part of that charade, and then we get shocked. Well, why don't you want to come to church? You just don't believe. No, they don't want to be a part of this BS charade that we've created called Christianity. Nobody wants that. No, no, no. What people want is honest and real. And that's what I love about Matthew is that it gets so real. Whose mother was Tamar. Let's get into who that is in a minute. Going on. Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Amonadab. Amonadab, the father of Nashan. Nashan, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz. Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Once again, the introduction of another story. It's almost like Ma Matthew is saying, hey, you and I both know who she is. You and I both know who the other one was. We know this story. We can't keep it out just because it don't sound cool. We're not going to act like that's not who our family is. We're not going to act like that's not what our story is. We're not going to act like we got it going on better than we do. Nope, we don't. We don't. And that is honest and authentic and real. And, and, and the Bible, if you know what the Bible's really saying, it's so honest. It's so transparent. It's so real. The mentioning of Rahab is unbelievable in the genealogy of the Messiah. It would, be, it would be almost offensive to some of the listeners. Continuing on, Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Ruth is introduced into the story. Now everyone who knows who Ruth was, what she stood for, they're going like, what? And I'm going to get to all these women in a minute. It says, then the Obed is the father of Jesse. And Jesse had a very famous son because Jesse was the father of King David. Verse 6. And I love it because it could say period at the end of David and just end it there. But it doesn't. It goes on and says, by the way, 
David was the father of Solomon. And Solomon had a mom who was married to David. But remember this. Solomon's mom used to be Uriah's wife. So it includes the reality that David was not the first man that Uriah's wife was married to. And it mentions Uriah. Well, anyone who knew, knows the story knows what just happened. It knows that it just mentioned that David, though you may not know the story, was a king after he killed Goliath and he got a little too big for his britches. And it says in the time when kings go off to war, King David stayed at home. So his battle and his army and his everyone is out there to be fought, but he's at home. So he's somewhere he shouldn't be, not doing what he should be doing, which is when we get in trouble, by the way. And he sees this beautiful woman. Her name is Bathsheba. And then back then, it was, they were more land and authority. And if you were the king, you could have what you wanted. He, and, he has his men go get her, comes in and, and, and has her. And after he has her, she becomes with child. She sends message back to the king. I'm with your child. He brings the husband who's out fighting a valiant battle into the house, gets him drunk, gets him ready to go home and hopefully be with his wife because there's no pregnancy test back then or like DNA. It's not like you don't have Maury Povich going like, and you're the father, like, right? Like that's not going to happen. And so now you have this story that includes this super gnarly, awful, terrible thing. Murder, a cover-up. Uriah is so honorable before he's murdered, he won't even lay with his wife because he says he, does, he sleeps on the porch when he was sent home by the king. And so the king's plan foiled and he has to send him to the front of the battle lines and he ends up dying and then he takes Uriah's wife for his own. That's the genealogy leading to the first Christmas. Now, these people that are referenced here is powerful for us because I love, I love it because here's, here's what the Bible don't do. The Bible don't avoid the non-glamorous. The Bible doesn't avoid in our, in our ESPN highlight reel every day, in the Instagram world where you put the picture that you spent 14 minutes trying to get perfect. We edit everything. We polish everything. Everything's for the eye to be amazed by. Nothing's real. Nothing's honest. You don't post real life, you post the life you want everyone to be impressed by. It is very difficult for us to reconcile a faith that has this much honesty in it. But I love that the gospel writer said, you need to know who Jesus came from. Because the perfection of Jesus is made greater because of the imperfection of where he came from. Listen to me. I know you don't like the imperfect parts of your life, but it is the imperfect parts of your life that God is hunting with his perfection. It is the broken parts of your life that God is chasing down to invade with his hope and love and joy and peace and power. And sometimes we overstrive and do it ourselves. And here we see that, that, that the Bible writers are wanting us to know who these people are. Again, and, and religious people don't get this. Religious people get like, well, Pastor Chris, you shouldn't be bringing up all the broken like, parts of the story. Like, just let people believe Jesus and the baby and, oh, silent night. And it's just, hey, whoa, Jesus, put signs on our front. Come to our church on Christmas Eve. <laughs> and it's like, what? No, 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 no. That's not honest. Yes, he's powerful. Yes, he's perfect. Yes, it's a miracle. Yes, he's hope. But, but if you sidestep the chaos and the pain and the disappointment and the economic ruin and the violence and the oppression and the gnarly stories of all of who the people are in the lineup of Jesus' genealogy, then what we have done is prepared us to be everly disappointed at Christmas because we can never measure up to the false idea of what we think it means to be a part of Jesus' tribe, when in fact you might, you might line up more than you know. Why is that? For me, when the Bible doesn't hug, the, I'm sorry, sorry, it doesn't hide the ugly parts of humanity, it, it doesn't fracture my faith, it cements it. Because my faith is not, I don't need the Bible to have a perfect story with a great bow at every ending. In fact, that would fracture my faith. Oh, so it's for perfect people. It's for people who like got it all down. It's for people who do it right. Well, I'm out. But when I see the broken stories in Jesus' own genealogy, I go, wait, this thing includes people like me. Like Jesus came for me. Like Jesus is 
got hope for me because I don't have hope sometimes. Jesus is peace for me because I don't always have peace. Jesus has joy for me because I don't always have joy. I can get the things that Christmas is supposed to be because the first Christmas looks so much like mine. And what has that first Christmas got? It's got this lineup. And all of a sudden, now we start to unpack. Who are these women? Well, let me give you a brief rundown. um, um, Tamar, she had a super scandalous backstory. Too much to go into for today. But it's very scandalous and shysty and shady. And it's not the kind of thing that you would ding, 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 ding. Hey, everyone, thanks for coming to our wedding reception. Real quick. Since we're running down how we met and who knows who around here. Just want to let you know what's really going on. That's what Matthew's doing. He's introducing the, the, the son of the living God story. The risen savior that he now knows is met with. He's like, look, I met with Jesus. Look, the night he was being beat up, I ran. I didn't know what they were going to do to me, so I ran. But three days later, I saw him alive. And so now I don't care if you kill me. In fact, I'm going to write the whole thing down. Because I want everyone in my Jewish people who also put him to death to know what I think. So here you go. And he writes it convincingly. And this place for him is met. By this deep desire to say, look, I'm not going to hide the shysty, scandalous parts of this. Because that's actually what makes it so powerful for the whole world. For God so loved the perfect, got it together, everyone doing right. No, God so loved us as we were in the world. That he gave Jesus. Yes, that's what Jesus is. And and not only that, but then you have Rahab. Rahab, when she's mentioned there um, in in, uh, in verse 5... Rahab, as soon as the name Rahab comes up, everyone who's listening, every, all these Jewish people reading it would have been like, dang, man, you're going to just throw the family business in there, I guess, Matthew. We're going to include uh, crazy aunt. Right? Don't act like you don't have crazy people in your family. <laughs> that you know, when you're getting ready to go through the invitation list, you're like, should we, should we invite her? <laughs> I'm out. Should we? Because should we? you know if she comes, she's going to bring her kids. And when them kids show up, the bill goes up. (laughs) Rahab was a prostitute. She made money by having sex. She's in the lineage of Jesus. A prostitute is one of Jesus's great, 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 great grandmas. Imagine that. I mean, if that don't help you start to kind of unwind this false image of what you think Christmas should introduce to you. (laughs) It is not to come in and give your family story perfection. That's not what Jesus did. He didn't come in and say, none of these bad people ever existed and I won't be tied to any of them because I'm Jesus, the savior of the world and I must be part of the human race that's really good and then you can all ascribe to be like me. No, the Bible says that he became sin. He became broken. He came to a broken family system full of all kinds of gnarly, terrible past stories. Not only that, but Ruth is mentioned. Ruth was mentioned. Ruth was not even a Jew. She's an outsider. She doesn't belong. She's the adopted in, grafted in, the one who doesn't fit the mold, who doesn't think like them, act like them, talk like them, laugh at the same jokes as them. Why? Because she's not from their culture. She's on the outside. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You know what it's like to go into a family or go into a workplace, go to a job or to try to hang out with the ladies. And it's just like, man, it's just, it's hard sometimes. I feel like I just can't connect. That was Ruth's whole entire story is someone who feels like they just can't connect. And yet she's included in saying, for those of you who feel like you sometimes just can't connect, we got you covered too. Ruth's in here. But not just that. But we got Bathsheba in the lineup. Stolen from her husband. Husband murdered. Impregnated. By a man she does not love. And having to then live it out and do it. Jesus came from a line of adultery, prostitution, craziness. The worst kinds of sin that a lot of us think exist. And the point of the genealogy wasn't just to connect Jesus to Abraham. And wasn't to connect Jesus to David. The point of the genealogy is to connect Jesus to your sin and your brokenness and mine. It's not just so we could see that he connects to Abraham and David. It's so that we see that he connects to Tammy and Jesse and John. And to Christian. And to Aidy and to Michael and to Chris. 
and to Matt and to Rachel. That's why the genealogy is written that way, is so that you can read your name into it and say, wait, I'm included. My mess, my brokenness, what's wrong with me is lined up in the perfect redemptive story for the world. See, what makes the first Christmas so amazing isn't that it came from a perfect family. And I want to give you hope today that no one has a perfect family, not even Jesus. Here's the hope of Christmas. Is, and I want to say this to you because I, I want you to understand it. The lie that the enemy, which is the devil, the Bible speaks of the devil, Satan. He's, he's, he's a fallen angel and he has uh, legions of angels and they're demons. And they manipulate our minds and thoughts. They, they, can, they can help us feel, sense, think, and even have ideas that are not in line with God. And when we start to experience some of that stuff, if we don't know truth and we don't know how to say, wait, no, that's not true. That's not what Jesus says about me. And that's not what's real. That I, I actually can be accepted. And, and, and it, one of the tricks that he does is he makes you feel like you're the only one. Everyone else is doing great. When in fact, no, Jesus himself has got craziness in his family. Man, shoot, the lineup of his grandmamas. You wouldn't want to mess with Jesus' grandmas, by the way. There's some gangsters in there. But it's so that you can look into your own journey and realize this. And, and some of you might need to write this down. You are not the only one who feels like you do. I want to say that out loud. It's strong, but I want it to be. You are not the only one who feels like you do. That is a lie. You are not alone. There are plenty of people who feel just like you are going through just what you're going through. Do not let the enemy lie to your soul and say, you're the only one that doesn't belong in the genealogy. You're the only one with a jacked up marriage. You're the only one mentally weak. You're the only one depressed like this. You're the only one lonely. You're the only one single. You're the only one struggling sexually. You're the only one this broke. You're the only one irresponsible. You're the only one that can't get promoted. You're the only one that can't, you're the only one like that looks like this. You're the only one who can't seem to get that part of your life under control. You're it. You don't belong. That is the lie. The truth is that Jesus' mom, dad, and entire family felt just like you do. Embarrassed at times, I'm sure, to even talk openly about it. But then Jesus comes in. And the message of Christmas isn't a perfect Christmas. It's the opposite. Here's what it is. Jesus introduces hope to our imperfect lives. Because if you don't embrace that reality, I'm telling you right now, it, 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 you are going to have a difficult time because you are going to keep striving to get the peace, the perfect peace, the perfect joy, the perfect hope, the perfect love. And you're just striving, trying to get it for yourself. Or some of you just decorate your life so much. And you think you could decorate a messy manger full of dog and, 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 and cow and all kinds of crazy animals all around. It's just like sheep and dung and smell. And it's like Jesus was born not in a king's castle. He was born out in a mangy manger. And we forget that. And the reality is Jesus wants to come right into the manger of your own dirty heart and soul. And the places that are messed up. And says, look, the first Christmas, I was introduced to a place just like your heart. A place with brokenness, with a genealogy that's messed up. With things that don't know what to do with, you know, where do I slot this? How do I deal with that part of my family story? How do I deal with that part of my own decision making? How do I deal with my own failures as a mom, a dad, a husband, a wife, a son or a daughter? Because if you keep setting the expectation that Christmas should be perfect, my family should be perfect, we're all going to get, you know, a gift, no one's going to argue, the food's going to be warm, your kids aren't going to cry, all these like really weird ideas that we create about Christmas and think that that's what peace is. Peace is when no one fights and peace is when everyone's back home and no one's struggling and no one's having a hard time and everything's great and we think that's joy. That's not joy. That is an imitation lie that we strive and kill ourselves trying to get that nobody attains outside of opening wide the doors of your heart of the messy manger and saying, it is such a mess in here and that is the way it's okay to be. Why? Because Jesus' family story was so messed up and his birthplace was so messy. He came and he said, you want to know what's perfect about the first Christmas? The only thing perfect about the first Christmas was that Jesus was in it. So the only thing you need for you to have a perfect Christmas isn't to get your Christmas perfect. 
It's to stop striving and over-decorating and making. If I just shop and cook and clean and do all this, then I'll be able to experience the Christmas story. No, you won't. No, all those things are things that you do because they're good expressions of your love for Jesus. I so appreciate the perfection you make available to my heart and my journey and my family and my marriage and my story and my mental health and all the things I deal with and all the things I'm going through that I decorate and I cook and I welcome and I accept and I want. But you don't use those things to hide away or strive to attain the peace and joy that you are trying to get. You won't have it. And when you have the people at the table, you'll be the loneliest person in the room, even though it's loud inside. You still won't have the joy. You still won't have the peace because you are trying to get it your way. Christmas perfection is only available when you sit in the messy manger and you let the light of Jesus' perfection start to break apart the pursuit of your own perfection. The perfect family dinner, the perfect family photo, the perfect Instagram post, the perfect way to say it and to write, stop. It's exhausting. It doesn't work. You're tired. It beats you up. And then the 26th of December comes and you're just overcome with all these other emotions. Like, what happened? What happened is what happens when you make something else God that's not God. And when you make the idea of a perfect Christmas your God and not Jesus' perfection in your messy manger and your inability to get the genealogy cleaned up. Your marriage cleaned up. Your life cleaned up. You can't do it on your own. And when you accept that and just sit in the mess and invite him to break the darkness, shine that bright light like a star in this messy manger. Break apart my striving. I don't want to decorate to hide. I don't want to cook to hide. I don't want to shop to hide. I don't want to laugh. I don't want to take pictures. I don't want to do all that to try to hide the mess. I want to write the mess in my heart. I want to sit in the reality of who's grandmama all the way down to me and who dad is and what didn't happen and how it went. And I want to sit right in the middle of all that and say, that's where real Christmas peace is available. That's where real Christmas joy and real Christmas love Today, I believe, is an important day for a lot of us because I think God wants to rearrange the idea of Christmas for you. What would happen if we in this room decided that the first Christmas had it right? And maybe what we've done has gotten so far away from what that was about that we've become exhausted pursuing and chasing an ideal that isn't even what it's about. For the next couple weeks, ending on the, the 23rd, our Christmas service will be the 23rd. I would love to invite you and your friends and family to come. And we are going to present uh, the Jesus we believe in that we just shared today in, in a very compelling way, I hope. And I'd love to see your friends and family experience the Jesus we talked about today. But for the next couple weeks, as we go through the series, Oh, What Fun, I mean, it's a play on words. This is not very fun when you can't get the real Christmas peace. And you keep striving and it comes up empty. But today, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. If you can, listen, if you can just make peace with the reality that you need Jesus on a daily basis to provide you with joy in the storm, peace in the crazy, with love when there's feelings of a lack of value, that's not going to go away. If you're like, oh, if I just, I thought if I came to Jesus, that stuff would go away and I'd never feel it again. No, that's not true. I don't know who told you that, but it wasn't me. I didn't tell you that. I told you if you came to Jesus, your soul will be safe. Your eternity is secure. And your life on earth has the help it needs to go through the broken place that we all live on called earth. In these broken temples that we don't get to just make perfect because we chose Jesus. No, no, what's perfect is the perfect help always available that it's always there, that it's unconditional, that no matter what I do, he loves me the same, that he's available at all times, every day. And your worst sin, your most shameful, awful, terrible, embarrassing thing, I mean, if I could grab the most embarrassing thing you've done in the last six months and put it out there on the world stage, Jesus knows it. And in that embarrassing moment, can I tell you this? He loves you. Oh, he loves you so much. He just 
He would hug you and say, it's okay. I don't define you by what you've done. I define you by what I did. I died because I loved you. That's what defines you to me. If you can stop defining yourself based on what you do wrong and start defining yourself based on what Jesus does right and did right for you on the cross, this Christmas will be different for you because you can embrace your own genealogy, your own brokenness, and that messy manger and just say, okay, come on in. It's a, it is a cold stone mess, but I heard... I heard the writers say, I heard the angels sing, I heard the prophets declare that you have what I'm looking for, and I'm striving for, and I'm working for, and I'm grinding for, and I'm trying for, and I'm decorating for, and I'm painting for, and I'm trying to do it all and get it myself, and I'm just so exhausted of that. So I just stop. I sit in the manger, and I believe what they said about you would be true. And, and I embrace it. And I allow that peace to set. Oh, when you do that, you'll feel peace. Peace is for the storm. Joy is for the pain. Joy is not for the happiness. It's for the problem and the difficulty. That's what Christmas is for. And if we do that this season, can you imagine what will happen if everyone in this room lived that out? What if everyone watching online, what if we all did this? What if we modeled that Jesus? People are doing everything they can to try to find out how to fix this thing. We know what it is. What if we were not ashamed and we presented that to the world? Oh, our neighborhoods, our schools, our work environments, our cities, our states, our nations, our world are won over by these types of presentations of the real gospel of Jesus Christ.